So let me just say that um, all of us here, the Barbaras, the Teresas, the, um, all of the women who, the Tammies, the women that have spoken, we all frankly stand, Carla, we all stand on the shoulders of women who have gone before us and we have a great debt to pay. And for me to be standing here and all of us in this room to say that there is not someone who has really been the lead pioneer on this, it's a blinding glimpse of the obvious that I re receive this award, that I have the privilege of saying thank you to a woman who frankly has led, has been an inspiration, I think, for every woman in this room. She embodies tenacity, courage, generosity, and yes, great civility. She has been every woman's role model, and certainly mine. As the first woman appointed to the US Supreme Court, her achievements are legion and legend. She has been a model of vision, progress, and the future. She received the US Presidential Medal of Freedom and has a law school named in her honor. She's a woman with integrity, character, and courage. Oh, that critical courage, the form of every virtue at the testing point. A woman who loves fly fishing, tennis, and has even cracked the innermost sanctum of male power, golf, <laughs> with a hole in one. She has the heart of a prize fighter, infinite compassion, and a deep faith and commitment to the ideals of duty, honor, and country. One of the reasons that the people of America lose their hearts to her is that she seems to have no idea how extraordinary she truly is. In fact, she describes herself as a cowgirl from Arizona, even inducted into the National Cowgirl Hall of Fame. <laughs> she is an incandescent inspiration to us all. I'm great that she is my fly fishing buddy, and I'm deeply honored to call her my friend, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Bonnie. Now, what I wish for all of you is nothing but the best, and including the privilege of hearing Bonnie McIlvain enter, Bonnie McIlvain Hunter introduce you sometime, <laughs> because she has nothing but good to say, and it leaves you very uplifted, as I am, by being here today. She and I came to a similar meeting a year ago here. And I was so impressed. I have spent a lot of time trying to encourage education to inspire all of, all of our citizens to do a good job on enhancing the opportunities for young people with good education programs throughout the country. And that certainly is part of what I think the Andra Center has been involved in for some time. And it certainly represents what many of you have cared about for a long time. So I thank you, Bonnie, for a beautiful introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here and to accept the Barbara Morgan Award. And Barbara, how nice to see you here. Um, I want to thank everyone here for attending this conference, organized by the fabulous people at the Andrus Center. I, you, you might imagine that with my job back in Washington, D.C., I've attended a fair number of meetings. 
And I remember very clearly the energy generated by last year's conference when I came to this. It was very impressive, and I feel that same energy today. So I think working together, we might achieve something looking forward, and I expect we will. The theme of this year's conference, as I understand it, has to do with success. And you've heard from several impressive examples of successful female leaders. Bonnie McElvain Hunter is certainly one of those. I hope you've heard a lot about her. She's unbelievable. And so we've, we've been privileged to uh, literally have breakfast of champions here in a, in a way we'll all remember. And what a great way to inspire a thoughtful dialogue about the meaning of success. And I want to congratulate the chair of the conference and congratulate Barbara Morgan for her award today. That's a privilege to be here and see that awarded. And I am happy to um, be in a state that has made this type of conference and citizen participation possible. It's very impressive. I come from Arizona, and I think we've done a pretty good job. But you've done a better job than any other state I can think of in terms of honoring citizen participation in ways that do, does encourage participation of your citizens. And I'm very impressed with it. And what I want to do today is be brief. You've sat here long enough. But I want to discuss one method of encouraging citizens to strive for success that um, is sometimes overlooked, I think, in some of our states. But it's a method that um, Barbara Morgan certainly knows about. It's, it's civic education. It's educating our young people about what we have in, in terms of a structure of government in this country and a privilege and opportunity to each participate in ways that matter. And I just think that it's very special. Certainly Barbara Morgan, who was a teacher first and always, can confirm that citizen participation is terribly important. And you have certainly supported it in this state and with this organization. Now, some people are never given opportunities to engage with society and are not taught how to do it. Some people never have access to a, an impressive leader in their lifetime and don't learn how inspiring it can be to learn from someone who has blazed a trail. Now, education, particularly civic education, can be a galvanizing force in someone's life. Uh, regardless of whether or not you're the first to raise your hand in the class or the last, but criti it's critical to the success of our experiment in this country with democracy. Because regardless of the career path we choose, whatever it might be, there's one thing that we all can be, and that is citizens. Citizens who get engaged and participate in making our government and our surroundings better and what we want them to be. And um, it's an example of your state's motto, esto perpetuo, let it be perpetual. That's a good motto. And sadly, research completed by the think tanks and the universities and others is that we are falling short of teaching young people the skills that citizens need. Um, civic scores among high school seniors have steadily declined since the year 2006. Civic scores among middle school students have remained at a, the same low level since 1998. And on the last nationwide civics assessment test, two-thirds of the students who took the test scored below proficient. Now, only about one-third of adult Americans can name the three branches of government. 
Think about that. That's really pathetic, let alone describe their roles in our system. Less than one-third of eighth-grade students can identify the historical purpose of the Declaration of Independence, and it's right there in the name. <laughs> Less than one-fifth of high school seniors can explain how citizens' participation benefits democracy. And the more I read and the more I listen to statistics like that, the more apparent it has become that our society suffers from an alarming degree of public ignorance when it comes to the way our government is organized, how it works, and our system of checks and balances and the importance of an independent judiciary and all the rest. We're not doing the job that we need to do. And while the seeds of that kind of ignorance are planted in the earliest years of a child's education, too often the situation does not improve and is left unaddressed all the way through college and even graduate school. And I think this reality led the federal, our US Department of Education, to issue a so-called crucible moment, college learning and democracy's future. The, ninth, the 2011 report challenged all higher education institutions to create educational environments where education for democracy and civil re responsibility is pervasive, not partial, central, not peripheral. Now just think about it. Our universities, and that includes our graduate and professional schools, had to be reminded at the top level to make civic education central, not peripheral, to their existence. When I retired from the Supreme Court in 2006, I was not exactly a spring chicken, but I did have a goal that was still high on my list of things to accomplish, and that is to restore civic education in our nation's schools. I learned that for younger students, those in middle and high school, one of the best ways to educate them about the judicial system and democracy is by embracing the digital age. So as you know, I've been working with some experts in law and technology and education to develop and publicize and get used around the country a program called iCivics. I hope you've heard about it. If you haven't, start learning about it because we want to use it to help. iCivics includes some very exciting video games, curriculum units, lesson plans, and online fora for student engagement. And I think this is the most important work I've ever done. If the School of Education or Dean or University President is still anywhere near this room this afternoon, I hope the teachers who go through your schools and help you will be made aware of this resource for their classrooms. If you don't already know about it, look it up, iCivics. Yes, this Arizona cowgirl has actually gotten involved with video games, <laughs> and it's working. In the most recent school year, we had 6.5 million visitors to the iCivics website. Over 65,000 teachers in our country have created iCivics accounts, and about 24 million educational games have been played thus far. Now, I'm not accustomed to using terms like hits and unique visitors, but 11 million sounds like a lot of eager learners to me. And best of all, all these games are free. So, research also shows that access to high quality civic education is not, in fact, equal for all children in our country. And that brings me back to where I started. A distressing report from the Civic Engagement Research Group at Mills College found that the two most significant factors in determining what type of civic education a child receives is the socioeconomic status of the school and whether or not the students are college bound. 
we are clearly not doing enough yet for all of America's students, and we can do better as a nation, and I hope we will. Not everyone's going to grow up to be a Barbara Morgan, or a Bonnie McElvain Hunter, or even Cecil Andrus, <laughs> but everybody is going to be a citizen by design. And by design, government and a democratic process, it belongs to each and every, new, every citizen for our country to endure. We have to ensure that our citizens are well informed and prepared to face tough challenges. And if there is a single child or young person in this country not learning about civics or being exposed to effective and good resources for learning about it, then all of our lives are the poorer for it. So I'm here to challenge all of you today to think about how you will engage with your public leaders and whether or not you know people, if you will, you must encourage them to solve the problems in our communities and to get busy as active citizens to do that. Everyone in this room can play an important role in that effort. And if you're a teacher, whether you teach math, science, or English, I hope you will take the time to connect that discipline to civics education and teach your students that being an engaged member of society can be fun, even if it is a big responsibility. And I hope that you also know that I'm so appreciative of the honor that you named for me today. I want you to know that I want to help everyone in this state every step of the way you take in your efforts to rejuvenate civic education in your state, and I hope in all of the United States. We have to do that. We have to make it a primary purpose of public education to teach people how their participation in civic education and the structure of the government and the role of every citizen in that uh, can be fun, even though it's a big responsibility. And I think it will help every step of the way in your efforts to rejuvenate, rejuvenate civic education in this country if you set a good example. And you're doing that in this state. I've been very impressed. So keep it up. Set great example. We all want to follow what you do. And I am very grateful for the honor of being here today and for your extraordinary citizens in this state. So many things. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Now, do I, do we go over here? Are we going to have a discussion? Great. Is that what we're going to have? We're going to have a little Q&A. A little, little, little Q&A. Okay, he's giving the answers. <laughs> You can ask, but he gets to answer. <laughs> no, I get the fun opportunity, the uh, fun role of, uh, of asking you some questions. And I have to say, Justice O'Connor, yeah. it feels like we've been here before. We have. We have. <laughs> it was about I, a year ago, I and think. My, my jaw, my <laughs> jaw is still sore, and the bruises are still evident. No, no. But but I'm game in the spirit of. Uh, Justice O'Connor and Barbara Morgan and Bonnie McElveen Hunter, I'm here to try again. It's a pleasure to, to be able to host you and you. your inspiring remarks about the importance of civic education in this country, I think, will energize this audience. I and hope. It matters. It matters a great deal. When you, when you look out and take the long-term view of America's future, mm -hmm. What would you most like to see down the road in 15, 50 years in terms of energized, participatory Americans? What kind of an America would you see? Well, one that just has a very much higher percentage of active citizens in the country who 
care about our system of education, who are participating in it and making it work. And I think your state is doing a pretty darn good job in that direction. I'm impressed, and I visit many states around the United States, and I really think you should be pleased with what you're doing here. Well, that's very kind of you, and many people in this room are, are deeply engaged in iCivics. Mm -hmm. They believe in the program. Yes very much right. it's it's a very innovative approach right. the use of video games when you were serving on the supreme court would you have dared to tell your colleagues that you were now in video games absolutely i did tell a bunch of them before <laughs> i stepped down absolutely and and so this idea of having millions of children growing up learning about the structure of government and yeah. and the constitution is an approach that you hope will uh, help to improve the quality of dialogue in this country. Do you think that the quality of dialogue has declined uh, over the years? Oh, I can't say. It's pretty miserable, but <laughs> it surely could be better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, you, when you look at that decline, when you look at that decline of, of dialogue in this country, do you fear for the future of America? Is no, certainly not. I mean, we're not going to let our country disappear under our very eyes. We're not going to do that. We may not be perfect, and we may not be doing all we could do, but we're not going to let it disappear. We're a resilient people, a we resilient are. nation, yes. aren't we? Yes. And, and one of the themes of this conference, as you know, uh, that resonates among speakers uh, yesterday and today is the idea of persistence and courage, yeah. yes. and, and women need to right. sketch out a vision for their lives and then commit to it. Uh, you well know uh, the theme of perseverance. As, as some will know in here, you graduated uh, at the very top of your class at Stanford Law School, and then you had a little bit difficulty. Couldn't get a job. You couldn't get a job. <laughs> at and least not one that paid. That what paid. Now, but now, I took one that didn't pay, and it worked out all right at the end of the day. <laughs> Is that what they call a working vacation <laughs> yes, when you're not like paid? That. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, so what, what was that like? How did that make you feel as a person or as a woman to know that in spite of all your abilities, you were being denied the opportunity well, because you're a woman? I wasn't the only woman being denied opportunity. You know, that was a generalized thing. I didn't take that personally. I could look around and see what was happening nationwide as far as employing women was concerned, and it wasn't too good. So I didn't take it as a personal affront, but as a problem we needed to address. You know, at, at, at Stanford, of course, you were classmates with William Ren I Rehnquist. I was, yes. The, the late Chief we Justice. We used to go to movies together. You used to go to movies? <laughs> yes. Did you, did he you? liked movies, and so did I. Oh, did you have a favorite movie or two oh, that you I shared with him? I can't remember now. I'd have to look back and see. Yeah. But you know, that was a big deal at Stanford in those days to have an evening when you could go to the movies. That was a big thing. That was a big deal. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, was it expensive to go to the movies then? Well, I thought so, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so years later, when you and, and, and uh, Bill Rehnquist were both working, you both had paid jobs yeah. on the Supreme Court. Did yeah. you ever discuss uh, that time period when you oh, both well, graduated? Sure. Yes, mm -hmm. make jokes about it and all that. Sure, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. But he was a pretty smart guy. Mm -hmm. We were lucky to have him on the Supreme Court, I'll tell you that. He had a marvelous mind. And you know, scholars, on that point, scholars rank him as a very able administrator. Did you share that view? Yes, mm -hmm. he did a good job, he really did. And on this point, just for a moment, over the years, you served with several different chief, different chief justices. Yes. Would you, would you, how would you regard uh, Bill Rehnquist am, among the others, would you say? Well, I'm not going to rank him in any way, but <laughs> I thought he did a very good job, and yeah. we managed quite well in the mm -hmm. years that he was chief justice. Mm -hmm. It was good. We don't want to rank justices here. No. No. Good. <laughs> Got that, got that cleared up right away. You can do that, but I won't. <laughs> we can. So yeah. uh, speaking of, of the difficulties of, of women getting jobs, of course it was uh, years later that Ruth Bader Ginsburg joined you on the Supreme Court. Yes. She suffered a similar experience from law school. She was at the top of the class, also failed to, could, was unable to, to land a job despite her brilliance. Did I you two share yes, stories about well, sure, but we didn't spend our time talking about has-beens. 
we just tried to do our job. And once you're on the Supreme Court, you, you have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Believe me, you really do. <laughs> Pretty you, busy place, is it? Yes, it is. And you want to do a good job, so you can't, you can never spend too much time on one of these cases. You know, that's interesting you observed that. Tell us a little bit about what, how you spent your summers, because the court adjourns at the end of June. And Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I know you're not offering a commentary on any particular courts. No, but anyway, uh, mm. yes, it was nice to get summer vacations now and then. Yeah. And um, my home, for many years, was on the Lazy Bee Ranch, which straddled a part of Arizona and a part of New Mexico. And it was hot as Hades in the summer. We didn't have electricity, so we didn't have air conditioning out there on the Lazy Bee. So you just had to kind of suffer the heat. And we, had, we stored water that we had to have for the cattle to drink in big steel rim tanks. And my father let us swim in those tanks. I, then the cattle had to drink the stupid water, but there, <laughs> there it was. Anyway, that's, that's how we cooled off in the summer. We'd jump in the water tank and cool off. <laughs> it was pretty funny. <laughs> it's the highlight of your summer vacation. The highlight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you've spoken a lot about gender equity, and in one of your books, Out of Order, you wrote about the problem of gender equity at the Supreme Court, and you dedicated the book uh, to a female uh, law clerk at the court. Could you talk a little bit, please, for a minute about the changes in gender equity at the Supreme Court over the years? Well, it's hard to do that objectively for me, but anyway, we did have difficulty through the years getting any kind of uh, gender balance on the court. And to get the first woman was a big step to take. And having gotten one, you had to have two because you didn't want one isolated woman to look at all the time. <laughs> so it improved gradually through the years. But gee, it was a slow process. It really was, as you all know. You were there. You saw it. Would you? She's leaving. We saw that. We saw she's leaving. She's had enough. <laughs> uh, could you share with us for just a minute about yeah. the excitement you felt when you got the call from President Reagan that he wanted to name you as the first woman to the United States Supreme Court? Well, you can just imagine if we've never had one and all of a sudden you, you were asked by... <laughs> the powers that be to come and be America's first woman justice, it's an overwhelming request. And you have to ask yourself in giving an answer, if I do that, will it advance the cause or set it back or leave it even? What's it going to do? I didn't think I was the most perfect choice for heaven's sakes. I was just a young woman who grew up on a ranch and did well in law school, and that's about it. And I didn't see myself as being in the category of somebody who by any means was entitled to get that invitation. And whether I could do it well enough to justify it was something I myself did not know. I didn't approach it with the thought that, oh, yeah, sure, I can do that. I wasn't sure myself. And so you have to ask yourself, is it fair and right that I should say yes, and how can I manage? And I did sort of manage, I guess, because I did have the advice of my colleagues on the court who would, if I circulated an opinion draft and they had suggestions or objections, they would write me and tell me. So you have the benefit of the commentary of your colleagues on the court. You know how they feel about it, and it's a smart bunch of people, so that helps you. And then you can go back to the drawing board and try to cover the points that have been raised by some of your colleagues, which is a good way to proceed, I think. But it's um, when you feel like <laughs> if you're an opinion you've written is ready to be announced, they've stopped making suggestions and it's going to be published and issued, 
and you really worry, have, have I done as well as I can? Is there anything else I should do? I mean, this is now going down in the books and it's gonna be out there forever. Is that the best I can do? Have I done it well enough to justify releasing it? I mean, that's a tough decision to make. Uh, at least it was for me, because I never thought of myself as a great legal scholar. I was okay, but I, I don't count myself among the greats in that category. And I just wanted to feel comfortable with the results achieved in that particular opinion and to feel that I've considered the various objections in ways that maybe answer some of the questions or most of them and it's going to be all right in the long run. I mean, that's what you hope. That's what you want. You don't want to issue some opinion with your name on it forever that has led us down a path that's really not a good path. I didn't want that to happen. And it is a huge responsibility because once that opinion is issued out there, it's there from now on. So you want to really feel satisfied with it to let it go. It's an amazing situation, really. These are fascinating uh, points, and I'm glad that we have three more hours together no, to we talk don't. about them. No, we don't. You better cut it short. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Madam Justice, uh, when you talk about opinions, and, yes. and as you well know, uh, some justices are particularly associated with landmark opinions, John yes. Marshall with Marbury versus Madison right. and so forth. And rightly so. And rightly so. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you, if I may, in, in, your, in the course of your career on the court, are there a handful of opinions of which you're most proud uh, or were particularly most difficult? Well, you should have asked me that in advance if you were going to do that. I'm not going to sit here and have a few names emerge. I'm not going to do that. But yeah, I think some are probably better than others, but let's, um, I'm going to let that go. <laughs> you can go write a law review article on it. Well, I, you know, I think if, if, if we have the honor to host you again, I think that's the first question for round three. Well, That'll let me know three. in advance. In advance, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Don't yeah. get me up on the stage and say, oh, by the way. Rank your opinions here. Shame on me. Now, as I, <laughs> as I hear you, I'm looking straight across, yeah, yeah. and I'm seeing a table full of Idaho Supreme Court justices, your, your colleagues across well, there. Well, they know just how I would feel. You ask them how they'd like it if they had to face it forever. Well, as you might but imagine. you can ask them the same question. Living here in Idaho, you know, make them tell you what they're proudest of. This may surprise you. I've heard from one or two of them on some comments I've made. Yeah, it'll surprise you. Uh, Madam Justice, now this yeah. is interesting. When okay. you arrived at the All court, right. there were certainly traditions that were very male in nature. And, and of course, one of the long traditions was the practice of providing in each opinion, Mr. Justice Marshall, Mr. Justice Brennan, and so yeah, forth. We did get it changed to just justice. So you did that. And yes. how did that come about? Well, because of what you're asking. I mean, are we gonna perpetuate that or wouldn't it be better to just have it say Justice O'Connor, Justice mm -hmm. Rehnquist, whoever it is. Yeah. And I think it, that was a good change. And, and did you, did you make a, a real effort to hire more female law clerks to, to deal with the problem of gender inequity on the court? Well, I couldn't in one chambers correct gender inequity, but I could make sure that I always had a few women law clerks, which I did, and that was great to have that privilege. Great. Now, thank you. Now, as it happens, when you approach uh, an opinion, since mm -hmm. you raise the issue of opinions, may I ask, what was your approach? Did you ask clerks to write a draft? Did you draft a memo? How did, because different it justices work differently. It depended on the case. And sometimes you get behind and you, you don't have any choice but to say to a clerk, now you get busy and you draft something and see me and I'll <laughs> see you with this other opinion that I'm working on here. It depends on your workload. But it um, doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you have to go over every single word and see if, it, if you're satisfied to have that as your word. 
And I know you don't want to rank order cases, we've settled that, but were there particular areas of interest to you that you were really looking forward to writing on? Well, not looking forward to, but being keenly aware of anything that touched on gender discrimination. I mean, that was something, as the only female justice on the court, I had an obligation, I thought, to look pretty closely at cases of gender discrimination. I mean, it would have been strange if I didn't. And so I did try to look very closely at those. In the many opinions that you wrote ac across the years, including majority and concurring opinions, mm -hmm. you spun out a, m a number of memorable phrases that scholars uh, write about all the time. Like what? <laughs> Thank you. So in one of, I think, one of your most memorable opinions uh, toward the end of your career on these wartime mm -hmm. cases uh, involving uh, acts of terrorism, yes. you said that war does not, quote, give the president a blank check of authority. And that's a very powerful statement, accurate, I, I would say, uh, but very powerful, and it resonates in the, in the law journals and other scholarly journals because there are always concerns about uh, uh, the expansion of presidential power. Yes, mm -hmm. of course they are. Mm -hmm. And that's an area where it's kind of open for what the current Supreme Court chooses to do in terms of its consideration of issues. Mm -hmm. So that's an understandable concern of everyone, of all of our citizens, but certainly the legal community wants to take a good look as we go along. That's fair, mm -hmm. justified. Mm -hmm. Now, now, of course, <laughs> uh, among the areas on which you wrote, you, you wrote a number of opinions in the area, the non-controversial area of abortion. Oh, and, yes. And um, uh, did you feel any particular pressure when you had to write on those opinions? I did. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the only woman member of the court for some time, yes, I was very, keenly aware of that. It, you, you just want to be very careful about what you say and do. Yes. You know, I have to say, uh, as a constitutional scholar, that I've always really admired your establishment of the standard that state regulations of abortions could not impose a, quote, undue burden on right. the rights of women. Now, that's a standard that's had a very long shelf right. life. It's a wonderful standard. Right. How, can you share with us, how, how did you arrive at that? Because it's a beautiful, uh, powerful phrase. Yeah, I don't know. I don't recall <laughs> the details of how. But it was what I ended up with, and you have to come up with something when you're faced with drafting an opinion of the court on something. And this was a terribly sensitive issue. And you just had to really think it through. So I tried to think it through, and prayed that whatever I came up with would serve the nation well for a time. You have successors, and you hope that your successors on the court will do a better job than you did in solving some of these terrible issues that aren't going to go away. Well, you certainly have served the nation very, very well, and I have to say that many of us wish that you were still sitting on the Supreme Court, <laughs> Madam Justice. Thank you. And, mm -hmm. Thank you. And, And, uh, and, and, and uh, Justice O'Connor, I just saw the sign indicating that we're out of time, and would you regard okay. that as a court order? Well, something like that, but I, you know, we, we're seeing a series of films about the Roosevelt's, aren't we, right now? And I just thought maybe I'd share with you one kind of interesting day that I had when I was sent off to school. I, was living on a ranch that straddled part of Arizona and part of New Mexico. And it wasn't close enough to any school that I could live at home on the ranch and go to school. It was too far away. And so my parents decided to send me off to El Paso, Texas to live with my maternal grandparents, my maternal grandmother. My, my grandfather was not there too often because he was a cattleman and he was all over the country taking care of his cattle. So um, I did go to El Paso, and one day I was going to Miss Radford School for Girls in El Paso, and several children of ranchers was using that school for their, ch their girl children. And 
One day we were told that Eleanor Roosevelt was coming to visit the school. Well, that was a big name and we all were familiar with that. So we were told to dress nicely and be there early and that she'd be there in the morning. So we all showed up and we got to the school and all the little girl students were standing around the flagpole, which was out kind of in the front of the school there. And here came the black limo that was delivering Eleanor Roosevelt to the school. And we were all standing there so curious how it would work and what she was like. And she got out of the car and we got to see her. And she was a very homely looking woman, that's for sure. And the clothes in those days didn't do much to help. They were kind of lumpy and <laughs> awful looking. So anyway, I have never forgotten the sight of Eleanor Roosevelt getting out of the car and walking up to our flagpole. And we all followed so we could stand around and see her. And she made a few remarks. I do not remember what she said. I mean, it's the kind of thing that you just are never going to remember. It wasn't anything shocking, but probably study hard or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was an amazing day. And then she was walked off to go see the woman who was headmistress of the school and visit with her. And we were left out by the flagpole to say, oh, well, did you see that? So <laughs> that was a, a memorable day at uh, I school say, for me. And, and so she was a hero. Were there a couple of other heroes uh, for you? Shero, I guess. A shero, I stand corrected. <laughs> I think that's what I meant to say. Yeah, probably. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, that was an experience. Yes, I should say. Now, we, we would be very happy to suspend the rules and to continue this seminar. Oh, no. But I, th I don't think you're allowed to. I think well, I have to cut it off. You have I? to cut it off. <laughs> well, then I think we have so many unanswered questions that I invite you to return next year for round three. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's so funny. Thank you. I hope that was okay.